There are unique challenges in developing a new data collection pipeline, and usually the best solution requires many hands and problem solvers of all types. Please welcome our fourth team talk group here to speak about building a brain observatory for visual behavior. Representing the team is Pete Grabluski, Marina Garrett, Lindsay Casal, Kyla Mace, Sahar Manavi, and Justin Kiggins. Hi, I'm Marina. I'm a co-lead of the Visual Behavior Project, along with Pete and Doug, who you'll hear from uh, later today in the uh, whole cortex imaging talk. And this morning, Pete, Sahar, Lindsay, Kyla, Justin, and I are going to tell you about our team's work towards building a brain observatory for visual behavior. So uh, our experience of the world and what we see is influenced by um, previous experiences, internal states, uh, expectations, and goals. So for example, you're more likely to detect a change in a visual scene if you expect that a change could occur. So some of you might not have initially noticed that something about this image is changing, but maybe you do now that I mention it. So let's, let's do a show of hands. Who did not notice that there was something there until I pointed it out? Not many. Who still doesn't see it? <laughs> Who saw it before I said anything? OK, OK, it's not that subtle, but you get, <laughs> you get the idea. All right, so our ability to perce perceive the world around us and to make decisions about how to interact with the environment requires a coordinated activity of multiple uh, brain regions. And even a relatively simple behavior, like detecting a change, involves distributed circuits across the brain. These circuits are composed of uh, different cell types that perform specific computations. And in order to understand how these different circuit components, which are embedded in dynamic networks, interact to give rise to the diverse array of behaviors that an animal can produce, we need to measure activity across many areas, uh, many cell types, and in a diverse um, you know, range of behavioral contexts. And so uh, the goal of the Visual Behavior Project is to understand how visual information is used to guide behavior. And we aim to do that by generating maps of activity across large populations of neurons, across different cortical areas, and to share this uh, information with the neuroscience community. So while we ultimately hope to generate a data set that can be used to answer uh, multiple questions about how the brain produces behavior, including the role of intercortical dynamics, perceptual decision making, and variant representations, um, and Justin will talk about this a little bit more later, uh, the first iteration of this project is going to be focused on the question of how sensory encoding is influenced by behavior states, uh, such as task engagement, expectation, and motivation, and whether this is cell class and area specific. So this question of uh, uh, the influence of behavior on sensory coding builds on the existing brain observatory data set, which, is, uh, which has characterized the visual coding properties of over 37,000 neurons uh, across uh, six different cortical areas and in six different transgenic lines that uh, label genetically defined populations with a, uh, a calcium sensor so that we can then use uh, two photon calcium imaging to measure the activity of these different populations uh, in response to a diverse set of visual stimuli. Uh, and this is all in passively viewing animals. So we're essentially mapping receptive field properties to uh, drifting and static gratings, natural scenes, natural movies, and locally sparse noise. So all this data can be uh, downloaded. It's freely available through our website. And it's already being used by researchers across the world to uh, do novel analyses. Um, and in addition to downloading the data, you can go uh, to our web portal and browse the response profiles of all the different cells in the data set. And we have here uh, essentially unique visualizations for each different type of stimulus. So for example, uh, this plot on the right shows the response of a single cell to uh, the 119 different natural images that are shown as part of this experiment where each uh, radial spoke along this circle uh, is, represents one of, the, uh, one of the images, and the response to each of the 50 presentations of that image are shown by the dots along that spoke. So the, the strength of the red color indicates the strength of the response. So for this cell, uh, there's a, a, a strong, reliable response to images 1, 2, and 3, but essentially no or weak response to image 4. So you just don't even see the dots. There's just no color there. There's no response. So this unprecedented large-scale data set um, was produced using a high-throughput, highly standardized experimental workflow. 
um, where each step of the experiment is carried out by a dedicated team. So this is kind of the uh, Allen Institute specialty. Uh, so briefly, um, each, each animal undergoes surgery to implant a cranial window that allows us to access the brain, followed by a retinotopic mapping step where we can identify the location of different visual areas so that we can target them. Uh, and then animals undergo a habituation step where they are accustomed to head fixation and visual stimulation. And this is in preparation for the primary experiment, um, which is measuring activity in response to visual stimuli using uh, in vivo two-photon calcium imaging. So this data is then um, processed through our informatics pipeline where the two-photon calcium imaging movies are motion corrected, segmented, and has traces extracted. And this is all so that we can uh, analyze that data and then turn it into this web product that we share with the community. So to address questions about how sensory encoding is influenced by uh, behavior states, we're gonna modify a few key aspects of this workflow. And that's the majority of what we're gonna be talking about today. So importantly, um, we're gonna add a behavior training step prior to imaging. Uh, and Pete will tell you uh, more detail about this task momentarily. So now during uh, in vivo two photon calcium imaging, instead of measuring uh, responses to visual stimuli in passively viewing animals, we're gonna be measuring activity uh, in response to stimuli that the mice are actively making decisions about um, what the information is that's on the screen. And again, then we're gonna you know, process and analyze this information and turn it into a web product that focuses on the unique aspects of information processing in the context of behavior. So now Pete will tell you uh, more about the task. Thanks, Marina. Okay, so for the first iteration of the Visual Behavior Brain Observatory, we've developed a change detection task, which from a mouse's perspective consists of a continuous series of flashing stimuli in this case, eight natural scenes from the uh, original visual coding brain observatory. And we can train the mice to uh, emit a behavioral response, a single lick on this lick spout, when the identity of the stimulus changes. And if they emit this behavioral response in the short time period following the change, called the response window, they receive a reward. So if you analyze all the 64 possible transitions between these eight natural scenes, what you see is that the animals perform this task quite well and that they show a high probability of responding when the stimulus changes, with some changes being more difficult than others. For instance, the change to image 69, regardless of what the initial image was, <coughs> is relatively easy for the mice, whereas the change to image 77 is much more difficult. And in addition to the high probability of responding to when the stimulus changes, the animals also exhibit a low probability of responding when the image doesn't change along this diagonal. And so if you take these two transition types, both when the uh, image changes and when the image doesn't change, and combine it with the animal's behavioral response, lick, no lick, you get these four basic trial types. So on trials when the stimulus identity changes and the animal successfully emits that, uh, that lick in that response window, we call this trial a hit and the animal gets a reward. However, if it fails to emit the behavioral response in this window, we call this a miss, and the animal is obviously not rewarded. On trials when the uh, stimulus identity does not change, but the animal does emit a lick in the response window, we call this a false alarm. If the animal correctly withholds its response during the window, we call this a correct rejection. And so we compare these, these four trial types with our two photon calcium imaging to start to ask questions about how evoked activity in the cortex differs with behavioral response. So what we're showing here is a fluorescence trace of a cell that shows a nice, consistent, strong response to every presentation of this particular natural image. It looks to be some sort of bobcat. Uh, and this pattern of responding does not change uh, on hit or miss trials. Now, if you look at another cell, this is another cell from the same field of view of the same mouse, you see a very different pattern of responding. You see this very strong spike in response to just the first presentation of this particular natural image. And what's even more interesting is that the strength of this response differs on hit and miss trials. So it's this type of data and, and analysis that when we perform it at scale, meaning across mice, across transgenic cree lines, recorded from different areas, different depths, is when we can start to ask questions and really elucidate how visual information in the cortex is used to guide behavior. 
And so as Marina mentioned, to do this, we're gonna leverage the existing Visual Coding Brain Observatory with only slight modifications. And it's those modifications that we're gonna focus on for the talk today. So to start, Lindsay and Kyla, who work with me in the Surgery and Behavior Group, we're gonna talk about uh, large-scale behavior training of the change detec uh, detection task. Then Sahara is gonna show some imaging data from mice that are actually performing this task. And lastly, Justin will show some preliminary uh, analysis that really highlights the richness of the behavior data that we intend to include in the uh, future web product. So with that, I will pass it off to Lindsay. Thank you, Pete. So like both Pete and Marina mentioned, our inevitable goal is to collect data at scale. And in order to collect this data, we have to be able to train at scale as well. So we started by building a brand new behavior facility with 24 operant boxes that can train up to 100 mice per day. But before we get too deep into the behavior portion of the workflow, we need to highlight the custom tools that allow these mice to uh, transition smoothly between nine separate teams in the workflow. By working closely with the engineering team, we developed a new head frame with a unique clamp plate that uh, is compatible with multiple behavior and imaging systems. This head frame is implanted during surgery and allows us to standardize mouse positioning relative to a stimulus screen. And with the development of a motorized lick spout, the cross-registered head frame helps us achieve consistent spout placement tailored to each mouse and repeatable across multiple platforms and systems. Similarly, a custom designed software suite allows trainers to monitor and track daily mouse health, to see performance metrics in real time, and the software suite calculates and deploys daily task parameters for automated transitions of the change detection task, all by simply scanning the barcode of mouse's home cage. These automated transitions within the task assist scaling by providing a standard progression through phases based on performance and without user intervention. Phase zero habituates the animal to the static grading stimulus and reward systems through paired auto rewards to promote associative learning. Phase one uh, builds on this association by requiring a lick after stimulus change to receive a reward. Phase two introduces a flash grading and phase three introduces the final stimulus set of eight flash natural scenes. Animals are considered imaging ready when they show consistent performance on the final phase of the task. And now Kyla's gonna to talk to you about our summer pilot. Thanks, Lindsay. So in order to reach the scale, this past summer we ran a structured pilot to do some large scale algorithm testing. We used these three transgenic mouse lines, each with unique neuronal characteristics. After these animals are bred by our transgenic colony management team, they undergo surgery to receive that custom head post. They then go through retinotopic mapping and after that, we receive them in behavior. So at this point, we limit their access to water in their home cage in order to motivate them to behave in the task. Their first week with us, they go through habituation, which involves just getting them used to being handled and head fixed. And after that, they start working through that phase behavior training that Lindsay described. And for this pilot, they were trained for eight weeks, five days a week. So over the course of this pilot, we collected 814 one-hour sessions, resulting in 239 trials and 3.7 million total flash stimuli. And as we collected this data, we found that some of the lines learned the task quicker than others. And this lets us estimate percent yields and training times for each line, which helps us with resource management when we start scaling up to a pipeline. So over here is the fraction of animals that have learned the most basic form of the task, which is those static gratings, and have moved on to phase two, which is the flashing gratings. As you can see, some lines learn the task within the first week, some lines take a little bit longer, and we see the same sort of pattern when we look at how quickly they reach imaging criterion, which means they're behaving consistently well over multiple days. At this point, they're ready to be passed on to two-photon calcium imaging. And Sahar is going to tell us a little bit more about that. Thanks, Kyla. So I'm Sahar, and I do the optical physiology for the Visual Behavior Project. Um, so we did this Visual Behavior Pilot Study uh, that Marina alluded to. And the goal of this study was to uh, image mice and two-photon calcium imaging while they are doing this behavior task. And the pilot study allowed us to uh, test our experimental design, um, but also to learn some, you know, learn something about these questions that Marina asked earlier, such as how does the mouse's behavior affect the sensory coding? 
So in my part of the talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the behavior uh, of the mice that are actually doing this change detection task, um, about uh, how the transition from training to imaging goes, how that affects their behavior. And I'm also going to show you some of the actual two-photon calcium data that we get and the types of analyses that we can do on it. So when the mice are first transferred from the behavior training that Lindsay and Kyla talked about, to imaging, they've only seen this first image set, which we call a training set. It's those eight natural images that P also showed you. Over the course of imaging, they'll be exposed to three novel image sets that each contain eight images that the mouse has never seen before. This brings up some questions and concerns we might have, such as how do the mice and their performance, like how does their performance change, if it does, when they're transferred from their training environment to a new imaging environment? And also, are the mice actually able to generalize this task from the images they learned it on to these novel image sets? In order to address those questions, I'm going to take a brief aside and tell you about our primary behavioral performance metric, which is D prime. So Pete showed you this matrix here where we have the four trial types uh, based on what's happening on the screen and how the mouse responds to those. If we look at just the lick, por lick response portion of that matrix, we can, over the course of a session, look at the probability that a mouse will emit a lick correctly or incorrectly. D prime then just becomes a measure of accuracy of those lick responses. So if we look at the average D prime, and here I'm showing you an N of five mice um, across sessions, uh, we can see uh, how, you know, how they perform. So on the, on the left here, we have the three sessions immediately prior to the mouse being transferred to imaging. And you can see their performance is steady. Um, because we want them to be performing steadily before we transfer. This H is the very first imaging session, which we consider habituation day. And we do see a drop in performance as the mouse acclimates to a new rig, a new, like an entirely new room, a new operator, all that stuff can be stressful for a mouse, and so we see a dip in their performance. However, as imaging progresses, their performance comes back up, and in fact, it remains steady over the presentation of those novel image sets. So going back to behavior, and again, this uh, matrix that Pete showed you, we can look at the behavioral or lick responses that mice emit in, in response to these image transitions. Just like we can look at the behavioral responses, we can also ask how do the neurons respond to each of these image transitions. And so here I'm showing you each, each matrix here represents a single neuron across a single session with its responses to any of these 64 image transitions. And we can see that some neurons respond preferentially to either a single or uh, several specific images. We can simplify that further by taking the average across these columns to get these uh, mean image tuning curves shows the, this cell's uh, mean response to each of these image transitions over the course of the session. And much like the visual coding data set, we see that there are some cells that show a stronger response to specific images, whereas other cells, in contrast, uh, respond steadily over the course of the session, regardless of what image is being presented. In direct contrast to the visual coding data set, we're imaging mice that are actively behaving in a task. And so we can ask questions about how the mouse's behavior in that task affects the sensory coding of the neurons that we look at. So here we've... Uh, taken a mouse's performance over the course of a session, and we split it up into these engaged and disengaged epochs, where we call engaged any time the mouse is uh, responding at a reward rate of two per minute or higher. And so anything that falls below that threshold is then considered disengaged. If we look at those same image tuning curves and we separate it out by the mouse's behavior, we can see that this particular cell here um, doesn't seem to respond differently based on what the mouse is doing. Regardless of the mouse is engaged or disengaged in the task, the cell responds strongly to this image 104. Other cells, however, 
do seem to respond um, higher when the mouse is actively engaged in performing the task, whereas when it's not. So these are just some, of, some examples of the kind of data that we can get, the types of analyses that we can do. And Justin now is going to tell you more about our future web product and what, uh, what kind of information from this project is likely to be in there. Thank you, Sahar. <clears throat> I'm Justin Kiggins. I'm a scientist in the Neural Coding Group. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, about the data that we're going to be generating with this pipeline and the, and the richness of the data um, that, we're, that we're expecting. So as we highlighted, there's basically two, two main epics of training. So initially, animals go through multiple days of, of training um, on, the, on the task. And then once they hit uh, criterion for imaging, they, get trans they transition into the physiology rigs where we're able to, um, where, where we record uh, physiology data while they're actually performing the task. And so during all of these training days, we're able to, to gather all of the data that's associated with the behavioral training. So in addition to the, the trial structure that, that guides the task, we have uh, you know, moment by moment information about the animal's licking and reward presentation, as well as the animal's running speed. And then once we transition them into, into imaging, then we get to, to annotate this, uh, this behavioral data with uh, interesting neural data as well. This is the point where we're able to, to get calcium movies and, and movies of the, um, of the dynamics of these, of these cells that we're recording from, as well as gaze information, pupil size to assess arousal, um, and movies of the, of the animal's body position. And it's this, this, these data sets, you know, this, this concurrent, uh, uh, Concurrent behavioral and neural analysis is what lets us do the types of analyses that Sahar was was talking about. But as um, as uh, Gordon Shepard uh, noted, nothing in neurobiology um, really makes sense except in light of behavior. And so all this emphasizes this at the at the single trial level. It's also important that you know why exactly is this m mouse engaging early on and disengaging later? And so we can start to answer these questions about what the animal's strategy is and, and why they're doing particular things in the task by taking a longitudinal approach and looking at the entire training history. So for example, even when this, in this individual uh, session towards you know, late in an animal's training, we can look at how reliable their reaction times are to changes. What I've plotted here are uh, individual change trials, and each, uh, each uh, dot is a lick, the very first lick that an animal um, elicits after a change. And so we can see that early in the, late in, this, uh, in the training, the animal's licking very consistently within this re response window. But we can analyze this over the entire course of their training history. And so from day one, we can see how this, uh, this characteristic response of, of reliable licking behavior that happens before they're ready for imaging, how this emerges, what the time course is over which this emerges. And so this type of longitudinal analysis lets us uh, ask interesting questions about animals' uh, learning, how their, what their perceptual strategies are for, for under, how, how they are understanding the task that they're doing, what types of strategies they are taking in terms of, uh, in, in terms of anticipating changes in their environment, and what types of uh, variability we see in their engagement and motivational states. And it's important to note that, that it's not just engagement that we're interested in. Uh, there's a, a whole host of questions that are, are motivating, uh, motivating the visual behavior project, including uh, perceptual decisions, um, how inver object invariance uh, emerges, or object recognition emerges through the cortical hierarchy, and how different streams of information are, are, um, are interacting during behavior. But, Answering these questions can't be done with a single behavioral task or a single recording modality. And so in addition to the, the, um, the data that we've uh, been talking about here, we're also actively developing additional behavioral tasks and variants on the change detection tasks that let us get at some of these other types of behavioral questions. We are developing additional technologies, such as our, the NeuroPixels uh, probes that let us get single uh, spike resolution across multiple brain areas, and the mesoscope analysis that lets us record concurrent two-photon uh, imaging across different layers and different, uh, different regions. 
And we're developing these into platforms that are completely compatible with all the hardware that Lindsay talked with, told you about earlier. And so what this is going to let us do is basically target very specific uh, behavioral questions to very specific, um, very, very specific recording modalities. Uh, this poses a different type of big data uh, challenge than the EM you know, data that we talked about that was, was presented yesterday, where our challenge now becomes a, a challenge of querying and, and, and getting into the data that one is interested in. So questions with uh, perceptual decisions, you might be agnostic to, to what the specific recording modality is, whereas other questions might, have, might necessitate very specific recording modalities, but somewhat agnostic to the behavioral task, while still others might need a very specific, um, a very specific uh, corner of this matrix. And so this doesn't even, uh, doesn't even highlight you know, questions about specific cell types or specific um, epics within, uh, within a, an experiment. And so in order to, to be able to perform these types of analyses and, and, and elicit the full understanding of this data, we're working on uh, standardizing all of this data into a single ontology, a standard ontology, and a, and a standard schema to be able to, to do the types of queries across this entire data set that we'll need to do. And ultimately, this uh, you know this work can't be can't be we can't do this alone. So uh, the brain behavior and sensory processing team is taking a, a user centric product design approach to understand what exactly are the the core needs of the of our of our broader community of scientists that are going to be downloading and analyzing this data. How do we do, how do we share this data with them in in a way that maximizes its impact? And so with that, I'd like to thank uh, all of the people who have been working on this project, who have been helping to, to, uh, to push this forward, um, as, well as, uh, as well as Paul Allen and all of our supporters. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have a question, please raise your hand and someone will find you with a microphone. Hi, I, I noticed that there was a huge variability in the learning curve of the animals, depending if you were targeting VIP interneurons or excitatory neurons. Do you have any idea or speculation of why that would be the case? Sorry, I didn't catch the question. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. VIP. Sure. Uh, there was a, a big difference between the learning curves yes. uh, of uh, the mice where you're, tar where you're imaging or targeting VIP cells interneurons versus the excitatory neurons, and it was remarkable. So my question is that if you could comment on that. Yeah, so we're still collecting more data, make sure that that effect is real. Um, and we're also starting to dig a little bit more into the, the behavioral data to see if there's a failure, a specific failure mode that's occurring there. Um, so the short answer is we don't know why, um, but we're continuing to try and figure out. If we don't and we still want to use this transgenic line, as Kyla said, we'll just use the information of yields and training times to make sure we give them enough time to learn the task once they're in pipeline. Uh, I was wondering if we know which visual areas are necessary to do the change detection class. Um, as of right now, no, but those experiments are, are planned essentially as part of this project. We do know that the visual cortex is necessary. <laughs> We've. We, we silence that, and it uh, impairs the task. <laughs> so that's a start. So this is a question maybe for Justin over here. Um, I was wondering, how are you planning to analyze the, the body movement um, data? Like, are you going to segment it and track kinematics? Or are you going to be agnostic to the structure of the body? Or what is your plan there? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't have. Um I mean, I, I think that the, the emphasis here right now is on the on the richness of the data set, and I don't we don't have specific plans on on how to approach that. Um, there have been I, I think that this I mean, my hunch is that some of the most valuable data there. I mean, so so we don't necessarily need to get running behavior. We're already collecting the running behavior directly from the encoder, right? So specifics of the of the body positioning aren't necessarily you know, we can we can get some of that data elsewhere. Um, but I think more postural information uh, might be useful in trying to you know, assess internal behavioral states. And, um, and so, so I don't have a specific, uh, any specific answer to that, but um, maybe we can throw it in one of these deep learning networks that just spits out the answer. <laughs> if, if I understood some of those slides correctly, 
Uh, I'm struck by the variability of these transgenic mice in learning this task. It's, it looks like there are smart mice and average mice and dumb mice. Uh, is that a correct interpretation is the first question. And then secondly, is somewhere an effort going to be made to explain what the difference is between a smart and a dumb mouse? Yes, there is a lot of variability between mice, and 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 yes, we are we are actively looking. For example, you know, what, one thing that would be very valuable for us is to be able to identify fairly early on whether we've got a smart mouse or a dumb mouse, right? So, is there are there are there are there in this in this rich data with reaction times with running behavior? Is there an opportunity for us to kind of extract? Uh, extract useful information from that data that tells us something about an animal's strategy. And it might not just be a smart mouse or a dumb mouse. It might be a, a particularly smart mouse that doesn't do the task because it figured out how to do something else to get what it needs. Um, and so we, we try to design the task to avoid those types of things. Um, but, uh, but understanding what the strategies are that the animals are taking is, is exactly uh, what we're trying to do. I, I noticed that um, some of the natural images were more appear to be more difficult for the mice to discriminate uh, than others. And do you think that the um, images that the mice find difficult to discriminate would also be scored as more similar by human beings or more difficult to discriminate by human beings? And is there some way to test whether that's true? Would you like to ask? That's a yeah. That's a really interesting question. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, th there's no reason that this task couldn't be done in humans too. So if there's any, if there's any uh, uh, human psychologists out there that that want to go to the um, go uh, go and download the data from the Brain Observatory and these images and and run a similar task on humans, uh, I would be very interested in that data. Um, there is, you know, we, we have done some interesting, so we've got some, some pilot work uh, that we've presented um, that there's actually, if we look, if we go back to the original brain observatory data, um, the responses of these images in visual, in the, in the visual, higher visual cortical regions in particular in AL and PM um, from the brain observatory actually predict my, my uh, the mice's performance on this on this task. So there's something fundamental. There's there's a lot of consistency between mice on how they treat these images, um, and that seems predicted by some of the uh, data in the brain observatory. So um, if you want to come by one of our posters later, we could we could dive into that a little bit more if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> so thank you guys. This seems like a really incredible resource for the community. Um, I have a question about how are you guys going to practically share with the community? So at what level of <clears throat> the raw data versus processed data? If someone says, hey, can you just send me the DFS, the convolved spiking or whatever? Or can you send me the raw data? How are you going to index it across all the richness of the data that you guys are collecting so we can time lock everything? Um, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So. Uh, uh, those those questions are still being answered and addressed, and that's really what this what this kind of product oriented BSP team is trying to address is, you know, what level will this be the most useful and the most valuable to the community? Do we, you know, what types of visualizations do we need to build out to facilitate people understanding how raw do they do people actually want and do people actually need? Um, so our I think our our first pass anticipation is that this is going to be somewhat similar to what we released for the Brain Observatory. So accessible through the Allen SDK, uh, you know, first order processing, extracting calcium uh, traces, um, you know, all, of the, all of the core processing to get this to uh, a rich point for people to try to, to try to dive into. And I think there are open questions, you know, what, how far we go beyond that, um, and, and uh, yeah, so we'll see. So we actually have one more question. So today's presentations are being streamed, and we have a question from Facebook. I noticed that there's a blank screen between natural scenes now. Can you confirm that? I wonder how long the blank screen is. Is it long enough to account for, if any, transduction delay? Yes, it's a, uh, so each flash is 250 milliseconds <laughs> with a 500 millisecond uh, period in between. So that 500 milliseconds should be Quite sufficiently long enough for transduction delay, um, and so the the hope is that we're that we're 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 pushing out the this period into into a realm where um, where you know it, it's not just the um, it's not just the 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 short transition between two images that are driving responses, but that the animal needs to actually make a decision based on the two images that they see. Yeah. 
Great. Let's thank the team again.